Hi, my name is Susan. We'll be discussing the integumentary system for a &P one And the integumentary system and its components, or in other words, what is the integumentary system made up of? To begin with, the integumentary system is made up of our skin. It is also made up of skin accessories, and that is including hair, nails, and glands. But we'll be speaking a little bit more about the accessories later in this chapter. To start with the first component of the integumentary system, our skin, it has two layers, the epidermis and the dermis. This is a model of the skin. The epidermis is the top layer and is made up of stratified squamous tissue. All along here it goes. The dermis layer is just beneath this section here and it is composed of dense irregular connective tissue as well as some areola. Below these two layers is the hypodermis. It is not another layer of skin, just that hypo meaning below the dermis. This area you will find lots of adipose tissue. Let's discuss the first layer of the skin in detail, your epidermis, otherwise known as your outer layer. You can have four or five layers depending on if it is thick skin or not. The thick skin, the one extra layer, we find in the soles of our feet and the palms of the hand. The epidermis has five layers, and we will be looking at the skin model and looking at those in detail. Starting with the first top layer of the epidermis is the stratum corneum, and stratum or strata just meaning layer. The second is the stratum lucidum. That is the extra layer that we find in the thick skin only, followed by the stratum granulosum, stratum spinosum, and the stratum basale. So let's look at those five layers in detail. We're going to start with a thin skin that only has four layers. Here's the top, the first layer, the stratum corneum. As you can see, moving over, there is also the fifth layer here of thick skin. This is the stratum corneum, just thicker. The second layer you will only find in thick skin, this white part here is the stratum lucidum. So it's not really any extra thicker, but it's just the extra layer. The second layer or third, as you can refer to it in the thin skin or thick, is the stratum granulosum, and that is the stark line right under the stratum corneum. In the thick skin, you'll find it right under the stratum lucidum. The next layer is the stratum spinosum. There's a little bit more of that in this thin layer of skin and the thick. You'll find it running along here, the stratum spinosum. The last layer, the stratum basale. Here, this is our deepest layer. You can see it running right below the stratum spinosum. You'll find a high rate of mitosis here as well. This is the stratum basale going along here, kind of like that dark gray color. We're still in our first layer of skin, the epidermis, and you're gonna find four types of cells there. The first being the keratinocytes. Those produce keratin, which help make your skin abrasion resistant and waterproof. The second type of cell, the melanocytes, produce melanin. That helps protect us from the UV rays and all the harm that that can cause. The third type of cell, the Langerhorn cells, you could refer to those as the big eaters, the macrophages. Their job is to eat invading bacteria. And strangely enough, that when they do that, the immune system is activated. So they play a very important role. The last and final type of cell is the Merkel cells. These detect light touch, so of course that's why they're very close to the surface and they're in the epidermis layer. All right, we're gonna continue on with the next layer of skin, the dermis, and you'll find that just underneath the epidermis. Now the epidermis has four or five layers, the dermis has only two layers. So we have the top papillary layer, and that's made of areola tissue. We also follow it with right underneath the, the papillary layer, the reticular layer. That is made of a regular dense connective tissue. Those are the two layers that make up the dermis. And we're gonna zoom in now on the model to look at the structures that you'll find in the dermis. The first layer of the dermis, the papillary layer, made of the areole tissue, you'll find right along here at the top, right underneath the epidermis. Two main structures you'll find is the first, the dermal papillae, otherwise known as the skin nipples, and those indent into the epidermis above, causing all these indentations. The second are the Meissner's corpuscles. 
They're the light touch receptors that you see right along here, Meisner's corpuscles, and they detect the light touch. The second and final layer of the dermis is the reticular layer, once again made of irregular dense connective tissue. That sits here below the papillary layer. This is the deepest skin layer and it contains the blood vessels, as you see them running all through there. It contains the sweat, sudoriferous glands, as well as the oil glands, sebaceous glands. And the deep pressure receptors, the Pacinian corpuscles are found here. Since we're in the reticular layer, let's talk about the kinds of glands that you find there. The real name for sweat glands is sudoriferous glands, and this is an example of one. There are two kinds of sudoriferous glands, eccrine and apocrine. And eccrine is actually our most common. You're going to find that in the palms of your hands, sole of your feet, and your forehead. So these are used mostly for thermoregulation and to help cool you off. They empty directly onto your skin, which is why you always feel the wet moisture, your sweat, on your skin. So they empty directly onto the skin through pores. The other kind of gland, the apocrine, does not. They empty into our hair follicles. And here is some examples of hair follicles, but they, those apocrine glands actually empty into the hair follicles first. They do not go directly to the skin. They're also found in our axillary region, your armpits, and the body's genital regions. This is a picture of a sebaceous gland. You'll find them surrounding the hair follicles. And here is one where it's opened up and you can see more inside, you can see through to the hair follicle. The sebaceous gland, otherwise known as the oil gland, produces sebum, and let's only use that word. We also have two neat special types of glands to remember. Mam mammary glands are actually modified sweat glands which produce milk. And then ceruminous glands, those make cerumen, or what we call earwax. So cerumen is just a fancy word for earwax, and that's our final type of gland. So let's talk now about your skin color and what affects it. We have two things that does, pigmentation and dermal blood supply. Pigmentation, or the coloring of your skin, it can be affected by carotene, which if you see the word carrot in there, Carotene may, can make your skin more orangey. And a really good example is the baby that eats too many jars of carrot baby food. A baby can actually get more orangey. The second is melanin, and that produces more of a brownish color. So if you have browner skin, it doesn't mean that you have more melanin being made. It means that your melanocytes, they're working better. So they're making more melanin in your body that ultimately can protect us better from UV rays as well. So people with paler skin are going to burn more easily. That's my life story. The dermal blood supply, your hemoglobin, that's kind of considered if you think of somebody blushing. When they get nervous and they start to get red, it's about the capillaries being so close to the surface and how they open up and how much blood rushes in. So that is something else that does affect your coloring because you can get up and get pinker or redder. And anywhere from small areas on your body to all throughout. So our skin plays very many important roles. We have seven functions of our skin, which most are, not all, but most are protective functions. As a chemical barrier, this is actually accomplished by having our permeable keratinized cells as well as pain receptors. So if something happens, it can alert the nervous system to possible damage going on, anything dealing with acids and bases. As a physical barrier, the skin is waterproof. So that's really good for things staying in and outside stuff staying out. As a biological barrier, remember we mentioned those macrophages earlier, and when phagocytes ingest foreign substances and pathogens, preventing them from, from penetrating into deeper tissues, our skin is a biological barrier. Um, we also have body temperature regulation. So our skin helps to regulate us, thermoregulation. When we're too hot, we sweat. When we're too cold, we warm up with shivering. 
Our skin also plays an important role with cutaneous sensory reception, and that cutaneous word just meaning skin, but skin sensory reception. So it can detect touch, pain, heat, cold, many things that it can detect. Our skin, interestingly, is also a blood reservoir. At any one time, it's containing 5% of our totals, total body's blood, so it can also be a blood reservoir. And last but not least, our skin excretes urea and ammonia. So what can go wrong with our skin? Or in fancy speak, homeostatic imbalances of the skin. The first one is striae, otherwise known as stretch marks. Yeah, ladies, they happen. The dermis tears and is repaired with more collagen fibers, leaving behind a stretch mark, a striae. Another thing that can go wrong is blisters. They also happen. The top layer of our skin, the epidermis, actually separates from the dermis, and then that separation, that gap, gets filled with water. Don't pop them. Effects from UV rays. They can cause skin cancer. UV rays can also cause skin to lose its elasticity over time. A fourth item that can happen to skin is just abnormal coloration of the skin. So we can do that through cyanosis. Uh, that's actually when you're turning blue due to a lack of oxygen. So being choked, you know, not breathing, but anything that's having you do turn blue. Eurythma, or otherwise known as blushing. Pallor, that's a fancy word for being pale. And then jaundice, when your skin is kind of yellowy. That's, um, that can happen in babies when too much bilirubin is in the liver. So something else that can go wrong with skin, hematomers. Another word for that is a bruise. So this is a picture of a bruise on a skin. Let's talk about skin cancer. There are three types. The most common and the least malignant is basal cell carcinoma. That actually starts in the very last layer of the skin, the stratum basale. Another type of skin cancer is a squamous cell carcinoma. That begins in the stratum spinosum. And then your last type, your worst type, is the melanoma, which resists chemo. It also has a high rate of metastasizing. So remember to do its skin checks. They're really important. And follow through with your A, B, C, D, sometimes E rule. A is for asymmetry. If something on your body, like a mole or a spot, is not exactly the same on both sides, it's asymmetrical. B is border irregu irregularity. C is in color. If it looks dark, purpley, blue, if it's just not looking normal. D is diameter. Does it get bigger in size? And then E, sometimes E, is elevation. It can even get rise up out of your skin a little bit bigger than normal. Pay attention, follow up with a dermatologist. Another thing that can happen to skin is burns. So let's talk about using the rule of nines. That's a method that divides the body into 11 areas, each accounting for 9% of the total body surface area. Your burns are labeled as first, second, or third degree. First degree is anything that affects the epidermis the top superficial layer of our skin. Second degree burns go down below the epidermis to the dermis. And third degree burns go all the way through the dermis to the underlying tissue. So if you recall at the beginning, when we were speaking about components of the integumentary system, one being the skin, and the other was the accessory structures, skin derivatives, such as hair, nails, and glands. We spoke a little bit about glands. We talked about the sebaceous glands, and the odoriferous glands. Hair plays an important role besides just looking pretty. So it can help to cushion from impact. It gives sensory input. If you want to know if something's walking on you, the hair will definitely give sensory input. And also our nose hairs help to filter the air that we breathe. Nails also have a use. They're handy as providing production and they're also good for tools. So that wraps up our integumentary system and the components of it, how our skin functions and serves us.